I would like to stay in the same mood, if I may say, doing Lord's will as the best way of praising him in difficulty, but also in prosperity. But I have to start by telling you that, as it oft often is with assignments, I was uneasy when I got the assignment. <laughs> it's how it is with homework. Because I was thinking, what is praise? Well, by now, hearing what Brother Obi said, what uh, Brother Harry said, you probably have a pretty good idea that praise is an expression of admiration, love, adoration, approval, and prosperity. That's a more difficult term. And I will explain to you why this term became a little bit difficult for me. Some time ago, we had two visitors from Africa. This was Brother Moses and Brother Pius. I don't know how many of you met them when they were visiting me here. Two wonderful brothers. And during the fellowship, I asked them the questions, so, Brother Moses, Brother Pius, where is it better to serve the Lord? In Africa or in America? Ha, their face were lit with big smile. Brother, much better in, America, in Africa. And I said, why do you say so? Because you have everything in America. How can you effectively serve the Lord? So, that's why I have to admit I am perplexed. Because at the time when I look at this topic... What does it mean to prosper and thrive uh, was a difficulty for me. Now we are studying Daniel chapter 8. And we were in this passage when we read about the transgressor who reached its fullness and king shall arise having fierce features who understand sinister schemas. He shall have power of mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. So I thought, should I be talking about this type of prosperity? Probably not. So where do we look for examples of prosperity where we can learn something, how to praise the Lord in prosperity? Where in the biblical record can I find something which would be useful so from the Holy Scriptures we, we can derive some lessons what to do in prosperity? Should I go to Adam, Noah, Oh, maybe Abraham would be a good example because he was pretty rich. Job, David, Solomon. Well, maybe John the Baptist or our Lord Jesus. There was no one who was more prosperous than he was. The apostles, disciples, Herod. Oh, you may be surprised why I'm saying Herod. Let me explain that to you. In the book of Acts, there is a passage which says that when Herod was speaking, what did the people say? God is speaking, a voice of God. And you know what happened next minute? He died. The Lord killed him. So what is prosperity is really questionable here. And I'm going to settle our focus on one person, which is pretty unlikely if I gave you this list to pick someone from it. I would like to talk about Job. He probably will be the last person you will pick from this list thinking about success. So let me take you to a 10 points, a list from Job, how to praise the Lord in prosperity. Timeless advice for someone who suffered. But in a moment, I hope you're going to see this list and look at one of the chapters in the book of Job to appreciate fully the lesson. In my own words, to summarize, I would like to show you how you have to see. Understand what you see in prosperity, how you have to heed and avoid deceit, seduction, la fairness, equity, mercy, share with the needy, trust in the true gold and silver, believe it, the Lord is your healer, love kindness, mercy, be hospitable, and there's nothing hither under the sun. Remember that in prosperity. And finally, do not exploit or damage. Now let me 
go to the details, and this time using the words from the holy man of the scriptures from the book of Job, we want to go to chapter 31. And we want to go through quite detailed, as, as much as time allows, study of what Job said. We find Job here at the moment when he's finishing his conversation with his friends, and these are really his last words. His last effort to prove that he's innocent, that what's happening to him did not happen because he did something wrong. And when he does it, he enumerates what he was doing when he was prosperous. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze with desire? If I walk in falsehood or my foot has rushed to deceit, if my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has followed my eyes, Lord, use it against me. Punish me for it. But in fact, what Job is saying, I have never done any of those things. Notice, I made a covenant with my eyes. My heart will not follow my eyes. I want to give you a little explanation, which I thought about this last night when we were enjoying our fellowship, which relates to the old saying you may know, be careful what you wish, you may get it, right? Or out of sight, out of mind. What the eye does not see, the heart does not desire. But often our eyes see what's not there. I will just give you one example, which is kind of fun to watch. Look at this picture. You see the squares, like a checkboard? Which square is darker, A or B? Now, if you're like me, you're always going to say A. A is darker. Now, look what happens when I draw the same lines. There is really no difference, no whatsoever, between those two things. It's a deception of your eyes. And every time you see this picture, your eyes are going to say you A is darker, B is lighter, when in fact they are the same. And your brain, to amplify the contrast, is going to show you as the same. So why I am telling you this? Make the covenant with your eyes in prosperity. So your heart does not follow the eyes, what the eyes see in your neighborhood and everyone else is doing. Majority of people do this, this, and this. Be very careful. Because if you want to do the will of the Lord in prosperity, you cannot follow the eyes. Number two, if my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, that would be wickedness, iniquity deserving of judgment. That would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out of my increase. Enticed by a woman. You remember the seventh commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. What happened to David when he was taking a leisurely time and he was living a good life? He got into trouble with Bathsheba. People in the times of prosperity can fall into the same difficulty. Now, this is a peculiar difficulty, which also can develop into a more beautiful picture. So I want to state something which... I originally didn't think about this when I saw Brother Tim, Jesuit, and the family here. I thought immediately about Edmund, Brother Edmund Jesuit. And the Proverbs of 30, 18. When there are three ways for which we don't know how to trace. The way of an eagle in the air. The way of a serpent upon a rock. The way of the ship in the sea and the way of a man with a maid, with a woman. Now, these are much deeper symbols. But the thing that speaks loudly to me, if there's something you cannot trace or you cannot see, it doesn't mean it did not happen. It will become, as Job said, a consuming fire. And we see how much trouble in this world today happens this way when in prosperity people don't realize. Now, there's a far deeper 
meaning of, of those uh, ways which are difficult to trace. Uh, Brother Edmund had a w wonderful talk about this. I would like you to uh, have a look if you can find one. Moving on to the third point from the book of Job is the following statement. If I have ever rejected the claim of my servants when they contended with me, what then could I do when God arises and he calls me to account? How am I to answer him? Did he who made me in the womb not make him? And the same one creates us in the womb? Now, I want you to pay attention to this picture. What do you see here? Big supervisors and the sweatshop when they're learning how to tailor suits. So much evil happens today because people take advantage of other people. It is so difficult to be immune to this difficulty or danger of not fair treatment of those who work with you, for you, who come and are in the need, and things happen to people. In prosperity, you cannot reject those claims. Don't feel superior above those people. And Job says, they are the same like I am. They were also created by the Lord. I cannot do this. The next point which I would like to make here comes from the next sequence, which is related to withholding help from the poor, from their desire. If I have withheld the poor from their desire or have caused an eye of the widow to fail or have eaten my morsel alone and the orphan has not shared it, but from my youth, he grew up with me as with a father. And from my infancy, I guided her. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or that the needy had no covering, I'm guilty of punishment. In here, you can see what Job was doing prior to the misfortune which was allowed to befall upon him. He did not withheld from the poor. He did not eat alone. He fed those who were around him. He shared with them, helping them, filling the empathy for, for the poor and the needy. The pictures which I am showing you in here come from Ukraine. This is how they fight for bread. And you can find many of those pictures. In Ezekiel, chapter 16, we find the famous passage, which is, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread. Fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. I think we are fortunate living in America. I had a nice conversation in the intermission with Sister Julie, and we were comparing the conditions in Ukraine, in Poland, and Africa, and other countries. Fullness of bread and inability to share could become the opposite of praising of the, the Lord in prosperity. If I have made gold my hope, or have said to the fine gold, Thou art my confidence. If I rejoice because my wealth was great, and because mine had gotten much, my hand is overflowing, I am in danger. Gold, is it your hope? I have to tell you a funny story which I learned shortly after I came to America. I was at the convention, and I witnessed a conversation among the brethren. And there was a brother who I was told was very strict, and he was a serious brother. His name was Ed Lorenz. And if you knew Brother Ed Lorenz, you knew his profession. He was in the banking business. So the brothers surrounded him, and they came to Brother Ed, and they said, Brother Ed, what are you investing in nowadays? And he look at them, and he says, in gold, pure gold, divine nature, brother. 
So what type of gold are we investing? Is this the pure gold, the true gold? Or is this the other stuff? The next item on the list, I have to proceed with a little introduction. What you see here is a poet for hire. And what I'm going to talk about is a saying which I heard at work. When someone says truth is like poetry. And most people hate poetry. Especially in the engineering circles. A poet was one of the curse words which I inherited at work. Besides being a preacher, an academic, I was also the poet or philosopher. Why? Because people do not like things which are not precise, not, cannot be calculated, which cannot provide for the outcome, as Brother just said to us. Brother Harry put it really distinctly. It's not poetry they're interested. They're interested in the outcome. So, poetry of joy is for free. We will claim the reward later. But the reason I say this to you, because the next statement from Job is poetic. And you have to pay attention to what he says. And I think it's so cute. Because, according to my sister, because I have to confess to you, I did not value poetry enough until my sister started talking with me and she told me, you know what poetry is? It's an event in your consciousness, in your heart. What comes to you when you read certain words, and all of a sudden you see some. So I'm curious what is going to appear in your heart. If I have looked at the sun with its shone, or the moon going in splendor, and my heart was secretly enticed, and my hand threw a kiss from my mouth, what comes to your mind? What is expressed in this statement from Job? Let me suggest to you that this is a poetic expression that when there are things we encounter which we admire, like the beautiful sunset or sunrise, the splendor of the moon, the nature, we may be inclined to worship the nature, not the creator. So my question to you, what is your can't kissing when you're seeing things around you in prosperity? Think about idolatry, which does not come to us through the strange pictures. It comes very subtly when we start kissing our own hands in admiration for something else. Continuing with Job. Have I rejoiced at the misfortune of my enemy or became excited when evil found him? No. I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for his life in a curse. Think about this for a moment. What is Job telling us here? Have you ever heard the rule, the enemies of my enemies are my friends? This is how people function, right? They become immediately joyful because something bad happened to other people. What he is stating here, have I ever rejoiced at the misfortune of my enemy? No, I have not done that. Look at the noble character of Job, who had everything. He lost it, and he did not give up. Have the people of my tent not said, who can find one who has not been satisfied with his meat? The stranger had not spent the night outside, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. What was Job doing in his prosperity? Remember what happened to Abraham when he was looking around his tent? He saw the travelers, he invited them, he hosted the angels. There's one German word, I don't know if you ever heard it, if you did not, you, you can ask Brother David Skarbek. He's going to tell you because he lives in Alsace in France and he's visiting here, making our convention international, along with our friends from Canada. 
And the word is rise fever. And it describes the feeling of excitement combined with anxiety, nervousness that you would have because you're anticipating a trip. Sometimes it's a business trip. Sometimes it's a trip which is even more important than that. I have to tell you uh, that we had no anxiety because we knew we were going to end up at Brother Ernie's and Sister Janice's tent. And hospitality, in the true sense, puts you at ease. Job knew, and he opened his doors to the travelers, to everyone. Because I am an immigrant, like some of you here in this room, I do have special place in my heart to those who come because they seek better future. And my heart sometimes breaks when I see how people are harsh and the difficulty would arise because of this harshness. Job, in his abundance and prosperity, never withheld, withheld his hand from opening the door to the traveler. Have I covered my wrongdoings like a man by hiding my guilt in my shirt pocket? Because I feared the great multitude and the contempt of families terrified me, and I kept silent and did not go out, go out of doors? This is an interesting statement. So what is Job talking about here? I think he's talking about how we own our own mistakes and how we behave in prosperity. Have I covered my wrongdoings? Remember what happened when Adam sinned and the Lord asked him, where are you? What was his response? She gave it to me. So the Lord went to Eve. So what happened? He gave it to me, pointing to serpent. From the very beginning, the lack of responsibility and pointing to someone else was a problem. So Job is asking, in my doings, have I covered my own doings? Have I pretended that it's not me? No, I have owned all my mistakes. I even embraced them, as Brother Peters, Peter said. The last one is a really peculiar one. If my land cries out against me and its pharaohs weep together, if I have eaten its fruit without money or have caused its owners to lose their lives, may the thorn bush grow instead of wheat and stink wheat instead of barley. Think about what is Job telling us in here. I think he's telling us that we can abuse the land. We can exploit the earth. Now, if you have any doubts, I think the coming years and the insurance premiums in Florida and the flooding and the hurricanes and all these things which we are going to encounter, including fires in Oregon, are going to teach us how we mistreated the earth and the pollution and all we do. We can even transgress against the land. We have to be very careful when enjoying prosperity and abundance, we run into abuse exploitation of the earth. Here they are, all ten in the words of Job. My heart followed my eyes, and now I'm making covenant I will not do it anymore. I will not be enticed by women. I reject the claims of my servant. I will never do this. If they have something against me, I will hear them. I am not going to withheld from the poor. Gold is not going to be my hope. My heart will never be secretly enticed. I will not rejoice from misfortune of my enemies, be hospitable, and cover my wrongdoings. A test. The first one, what is it? Make the covenant with your eyes. This is the review. Number two, don't be enticed by a woman. Number three, do not contend unjustly with those who are around you. Do not withhold the bread. Go to the pure gold. Don't go for this temporary stuff. Do not worship your hands or the creation instead of the creator. Do not rejoice in misfortune. Open the door. Be hospitable. Do not push the responsibility and do not exploit and abuse. All of this 
is a good advice. Apostle Paul knew how to abound. I know how to be, be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in, and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. We can and we will praise in all circumstances, doing the Lord's will regardless what happens to us, because through Christ who strengthens us, we can do all things. I am going to close with the same verse as Brother, Brother Herod. Hallelujah. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, allow me to say one word about this wonderful term, hallelujah. You know what that really means in Hebrew? Haya Yahweh means praise and glorified be the name of the Lord. The story which remains with me for the rest of my life took place when one day we went to hear the Messiah. It was in the old communist times where any display of religion was looking upon as very un inappropriate, at least, if not punishable. So you go to this concert hall, and there are people, and the moment comes in the Messiah Oratorio when they start singing Hallelujah. And then there are all the big professors, the big uh, wigs, so to speak, from the town, etc. And the moment they start singing, first the clerics, and then everyone else stands up, because they would never sit down when these words are uttered. I think there is something in this statement which should instill in us adoration, appreciation, glory in the name of our Heavenly Father. Now you probably thought that I made a mistake because I didn't pass the greetings from the Portland class. <laughs> and indeed, I made a mistake because... The warm introduction Brother William provided yesterday just overtook me. And <laughs> I was thinking about his words and how he translated my name so nicely. And, but I am here to finish my talk and the time with you by saying that the brethren voted. They voted in Portland to send special love and uh, the entire class, but also my family in Canada, British Columbia, the Nemchik family my aunt, uncle, my cousins, and of course, the two Anyas, my sister and my daughter, Anya, they wanted to serve their warm Christian love to tell you that they love you and they will be with you, if not on Zoom, in their prayers, because right now they are at the meeting in Portland. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 